The scripture reading today is from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a, on page 865 in the Old Testament of your Pew Bible. Now hear the word of the Lord. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to checking out the painted frog. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this Advent season, we've been looking at the theme of God's promise for better lives for our days. And and that's really the hope of Advent and Christmas, that God has done something in Jesus that changes everything. And so for this series of messages during Advent, we've been looking at scriptures that, that don't immediately strike us as relating to Advent or the Christmas story. The connection, however, is the idea of God's promises of better days, promises which all eventually find their fulfillment in the coming of Jesus. And this week we're going to look at what the prophet Micah has to say about the coming days of Christ. I was a, a fifth grade student at Pine Forest Elementary School in Pensacola, Florida. I had just left the Catholic school and moved to public school, so I was one of the new kids on the block. But that first fall there, I always felt sorry for a fellow student named Willie. Willie had a high, squeaky voice, he was hyperactive, he was socially inept, had this tall, skinny body. Willie was an easy target for grade school thugs. People teased Willie until he, well, until he would, as they called it, spaz out. Now, I never really participated in the teasing, but I certainly didn't try to stop it either. That is, until one day in December, when we were on the playground during lunch recess, and Willie was trapped in the corner of the field. Six boys surrounded him. They were taunting and teasing and flinging pine cones at him. And as I watched, something snapped inside of me, and I, I raced toward the corner of the field. I dove sideways into that throng of boys, knocking down three of them, after I gathered myself and joined Willie in the corner, I screamed at the thugs, Hey, if you want to go after Willie, you've got to come through me. After a slight moment of confusion, one of the bullies yelled, Yeah, let's pound both of them. <laughs> and so they proceeded to pummel both of us. But you know, it was great. For the first time in my career as an elementary student, I felt I actually cared about something beyond myself. I was a freedom fighter against oppression and injustice. And that day on the elementary school playground, my heart cracked wide open. And I looked around at the world, or at least Pine Forest Elementary, and a voice whispered in my ear, this isn't right. It's not supposed to be this way. Violence and injustice shouldn't have the upper hand. There has to be a better way. Now, I have no idea where that voice came from, but it was loud and clear and obvious. And of course, you can probably go on any playground where there's a bunch of kids playing, and you'll eventually hear someone scream the same thing. Hey, that's not fair! New Testament scholar N.T. Wright has said this, a sense of justice comes with the kit of being human. 
And I didn't know it at the time, but the voice I heard on that playground was the same whisper that comes out of the pages of the Bible. It begins quietly. But by the time we reach the books of the prophets, the voice gets louder and louder. The voice of God through those wild-eyed, visionary, peace-hungry prophets went something like this. You were made for better days. The strong oppress the weak. The rich pummel the poor. Nation goes to war against nation. But I, the Lord, have made you for better days and I will bring those better days to pass. Now, the ancient Jews had a word to describe those better days. That word was shalom, Hebrew for peace. And in the Bible, God's peace, God's shalom, meant much more than simply the absence of war. It indicated more than just a positive state in my soul or a private kind of transaction between me and God. The longing for God's shalom included all those things, yes. But for those radical Jewish believers, peace was much bigger, much broader than that. It meant wholeness and completeness throughout all of creation. It meant the end of injustice. It meant the the rich would no longer devour the poor. It meant all brokenness would be set right and healed. It meant that people would actually love one another. Shalom would flow deep and broad, embracing all of creation, including plants and animals and, and the very earth itself. And as the story of Scripture unfolded, God began to sort of drop clues that, that would awaken our hearts, and we would long for those better days. For the Jews, the hope of shalom was wrapped up in a person. Someone is coming, they believe, who would open up that door to peace. The question was who? The prophet Isaiah put it like this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In Isaiah 11, God whispered again and said, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, And from its roots, a branch will bear fruit. And who is this bearer of shalom? Where will he come from? Now, the prophet Micah, who who wrote what we heard just a moment ago, lived about 700 years before Jesus was born in a a mid-sized town called Morasheth. It was about 25 miles southwest of Jerusalem close to what we would call modern-day Gaza. The Hebrew word for prophet literally means to see. And like the other prophets, Micah saw things that everyone else wanted to ignore. Micah saw things much worse than a gang of little thugs beating up small guys on the field. He records unspeakable violence and injustice in chapter 2, and three. And not only did this injustice outrage Micah, it also connected him once again with those ancient promises of better days. And God whispered into Micah's ear, remember Micah, someone is coming who will bring peace. And as a result, the promises of better days, they pop up again and again in this short little book of Micah. Micah describes the coming one in chapter 4, verse 3, as someone who judges between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. Under this person's leadership, the nations, it says, will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And, of course, it also says that nations will not take up sword against nation nor Will they train for war anymore? This is a a beautiful picture of deep and rich and wide shalom. Shalom. 
And perhaps, perhaps many of us echoed for this longing for better days when we were 13 or 15 or 23. But then we got busy. And we decided to settle into real life. I mean, who has time to dream about better days when we're not sure how we're going to make it through this day? We've got bills to pay and kids to drive and term papers to finish and health problems to resolve and a retirement plan to build. The list of responsibilities goes on and on and on. And longing for peace, longing for solving the issues of injustice, that aching for better days, well, we just don't have the time or the energy anymore. I mean, after all, if we, if we actually looked long and hard at the world around us, we'd probably just get depressed and cynical. For instance, I want you to try this experiment. You can try it when you go home today. If you really want to, you can pull out your phone and look up this now. Just make sure your phone's off so we don't hear you. <clears throat> Purely at random, pick a copy of some paper. I chose the New York Times. And I thought I would seek out how many articles in that issue relate to the world's longing and aching for peace and justice. <laughs> Tried this experiment on December the 20th, 2006. That was when I still read the newspaper. And I got so depressed that I tried to escape to the sports section. Yeah, you guessed it. But there I read one article about a football player who was fined $35,000 for spitting in another player's face and another story about a brawl during a basketball game that resulted in mass suspensions for both teams. No wonder we're cynical. No wonder we stop longing for better days. Nevertheless, every once in a while, something cracks our hearts wide open, and that voice whispers to us, you were made for better days. You long for peace because there is a peace giver. You know, Micah's times were much like ours. Micah chapter 5 verse 1 describes a king being publicly humiliated. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek. And then in verse 3, the prophet describes the time when the nation would be conquered, divided, sent into exile. And Micah compares these days of abandonment and groaning to a woman's groaning during childbirth. Yet into this violent and seemingly hopeless situation, God, Scripture tells us, will send the peace bearer. But look carefully, Michael warns, because you might just miss his coming. You see, when God brings peace, God will do it so quietly that you just might miss it. That's the way God's shalom comes to us. Not with some kind of a marching band and hoopla and press coverage, but quietly and to unlikely people. In Isaiah 11, God told us that the Messiah would come like a, a branch growing up out of a dead stump from death and decay. And then suddenly, poof, the peace bringer would arise. And Micah tells us in chapter 5, verse 2, that this coming one, the Messiah, will come from a very quiet place, Bethlehem. Do you know that Bethlehem literally means the house of bread? It was a small, insignificant town. And though he comes from this small, insignificant place, he is nevertheless God's peace bringer, the peace giver. Verse 4 tells us he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. How big and broad and all-encompassing God's shalom is. And finally, Micah says, and then he will be their peace. This one who encompasses all will be their peace. This promised shalom is wrapped up in a person. 
This reality that we're aching and longing for that seems always just a, just a little out of reach has come. And it's come in the person called the Messiah. Who is it? Micah, Micah hits a dead end. He knows God's shalom is big and beautiful and real. And he knows it will come through someone who will be sent by God. But we're going to have to wait for Christmas. It's 700 years later, as it's recorded in the New Testament, there's a story about a strange birth. Someone is born, and the clues begin to point in the same direction. And just as Micah predicted, this peace bringer comes from Bethlehem. And then another witness proclaims the following about the coming one, saying, by the tender mercy of God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the ways of peace. And when he comes, the scriptures tell us, when he comes, the angels start singing glory to God in the highest of heaven and peace on earth to all whom God favors. Could it be? Could it be that, that this is the one that all of the clues are pointing to? And around the globe on Christmas Eve, followers of Jesus will celebrate the coming of peace that God intended for his creation. Once lost because of sin and longed for by all creation, this one who has come, the Messiah, has come in Jesus he is the one that Micah pronounced who would be our peace. Now, that may all sound a bit abstract and impersonal. And you might even wonder, well, how in the world does this affect my life? In 1989, remember Skinny Willie? I met him again at my 15-year high school reunion. I was living as a follower of Jesus and a clergy person at that point. Willie had become a full-fledged member of the Communist Party. He was spending most of his time in Southeast Asia trying to topple the government in an unidentified island. And when I saw Willie, he said, So, comrade, why are you a Christian? What difference does it make? Why don't you do something really worthwhile with your life, like me, like toppling a government in Southeast Asia? I don't remember exactly what I said. <laughs> but if I could have that conversation over again, I'd respond to Willie with some pretty important and yet simple points. I'd say, first, you know, I want peace with God. I need peace with God. Now, certainly, I want peace for the whole world. But the message of Jesus, this revolution of peace that started on that first Christmas, means that peace has to start in my own heart. I cannot be effective. I can't be effective as an instrument for peace until I find peace within my own relationship with God. According to the biblical story, everything Jesus did, including living, teaching, dying on the cross, being raised from the dead, was designed to reconcile us with God the Father. And the Bible tells us that our relationship with God was not at peace. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we are, in fact, at war with God. We're not victims. We are actually rebels who must learn to lay down our arms and surrender if we actually hope to find any real peace. And that's why the New Testament declares so wildly and joyfully that peace has been offered. It says in Romans 5, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember that as a good Jew... Paul was steeped in the story of the Bible, including the promise of Shalom and Isaiah and Micah. 
You might also remember that Paul resisted the good news for a long time until Jesus finally broke into his heart. And Paul knew that Jesus was that promised shalom bearer that he had heard about from Scripture. Until I am at peace with God, I'm not part of the solution. I'm still part of the problem. But in Jesus... I can become a peacemaker in this world. I could be an instrument of God's peace. You see, following Jesus is not simply a, a matter of enjoying peace in my own heart and in my relationship with God, because the Messiah calls us to join his revolutionary movement of bringing shalom to a broken world. As a follower of Jesus, I'm now called to announce the good news, so that others can be reconciled to God. And we begin this peacemaking journey in our homes and in our neighborhoods and in our families. Remember that peace does not mean the absence of conflict. What it means is working through the conflict to bring peace into our relationships. And we stand up for those who are treated with injustice. We ask for the Messiah to bring his peace into our cities, into our communities. Being a peacemaker under Messiah's reign also propels us to a life of hope. You see, by ourselves, left to our own devices, we can never, ever finish the job of peacemaking. We might build programs and institutions and hospitals and schools. We might even start movements and initiatives but they tend to run down or even grow corrupt. See, all of our efforts are partial at best, and at worst, they're deeply flawed, filled with our own ego or unmet needs. But King Jesus, the Messiah, has promised to finish the job. And that's why when people ask, why can't I just bypass that peace with God stage and just move on to the good stuff? Well, friends, the Bible reminds us that, that we're simply sinners with crippling limitations. But God has a plan. God will bring God's peace. And notice that the call from Jesus to be a peacemaker is incredibly hopeful. You know that God doesn't call the perfect and the unbroken to be peacemakers? Isaiah 4, 6, and 7 says God chooses the lame and the outcast. The Messiah brings shalom to the earth, and he calls us to join in that great task. But thankfully, he doesn't call the perfect. He calls the wounded, the limpers. And that's really good news to me, because I am a life long limper and on this advent sunday as we prepare to welcome the messiah i simply ask do you have peace with god do you know within your heart that you're right with god through jesus christ and do you know god's call on your life to be a peacemaker i pray that you will respond to God's invitation to open your heart, allow God in, and to seek after peace. Amen and amen.